Well, it's good to be here. And uh, we want to just think as we come up to Anzac Day. And I think the war in Ukraine tends to remind us or help us to see what war is really like and the horrors that are associated with war. There's been some shocking scenes, hasn't there, with the casualties that you've seen on your TV screens. And like me, no doubt, you've been horrified by those scenes, by the sheer devastation, the sheer destruction of the, uh, the, the, civilian, ca- the, the civilian population, the casualties, their apartment blocks, the hospitals, all those things. You've seen dead bodies in the street. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And on Anzac Day, we think about the 100,000 or more Australians who have died in various wars and the several hundred thousand who've been wounded, both physically and psychologically, the countless others who have suffered. So come with me today as we, as we think about World War I. We think about what happened on the Western Front. So take a look at these pictures that are going to come up. They give you some idea of what it was like. They're terrible, aren't they? So try to imagine what it would be like to be in this war. As I read this account from a fellow who was there, W.H. Downing, a digger who described the conditions, and just try to imagine what it might have been like to be there. He wrote, On the front lines, dead lay everywhere. The deeper one dug, the more bodies one exhumed. Hands and faces protruded from the shiny, from the slimy, toppling walls of trenches. Knees, shoulders and buttocks posed through from the, from the morass. We were soaked from head to foot with sweat and icy mud. The men in the front line stood hour on hour in icy slush up to 30 centimetres deep and were put out of action with trench foot, which is a, fir- a form of frostbite that often ended up in gangrene, the loss of toes or even feet. They were weakened by hunger, shattered in nerve by the continuous barrage. The, the rain pours in torrents. Some were forced to crawl. No matter how overcome, few dared rest because they might fall asleep and perish before morning. Rats in their millions infested those trenches and they were contaminating the food. There were two main types, the brown rat and the black rat. The brown rat was especially feared. They gorged themselves on human remains, grotesquely disfiguring them by eating the eyes and the liver, and they could grow to the size of a cat. Lice, too, were a never-ending problem, breeding in the seams of the filthy clothing and causing the men to itch unceasingly. And the nits. I'll end the quote there. Can you imagine what it would be like living in conditions like that with artillery shells landing around you and the constant threat of snipers? And during those conditions for several years, can you imagine being on the Western Front day after day, month after month, year after year, and virtually getting nowhere? That's what trench warfare was like on the Western Front in World War I. Death is an integral part of war. And on Anzac Day, we remember these things. We remember and we respect the endurance and the never give up attitude of so many of our troops who've been killed and have kept our troops out in those atrocious conditions that were Gallipoli or the Western Front that I've mentioned or the Kokoda Track or the siege of Tobruk, or the jungles of Vietnam, or the harshness of Afghanistan. We're inspired by the reckless valour of those men and women that they displayed at Gallipoli. And we're thankful for the personal sacrifice of those who gave their lives and who still bear physical and mental wounds from their service. We remember their blood trodden into the mud of a foreign land. We remember their sacrifice. And and yet, there is something noble about sacrifice, isn't there? 
And the sacrifice of Jesus is still at the centre of our Anzac Day symbolism. You'll see that in the crosses on the grave sites. You'll see that and hear that in the sacrificial language. You'll hear that in the reverence with which people speak about Anzac Day and what happened on those days. And we've just remembered the sacrifice that was Jesus's at Easter. But Jesus' sacrifice is on a different level. And our reading today from Galatians talks of the sacrifice of Jesus. Christ was crucified. And Jesus' sacrifice, his crucifixion, his death, is what I want to concentrate on this evening as we work through the passage in some descriptions. So Jesus' sacrifice is tied up with justification. See, justification or justify is used five times in verses 15 to 21. And so that's a little indication that it's something that's pretty important that the Apostle Paul wants to get through to us and the Holy Spirit through him. So to be justified means to be righteous. In the original language, justify has the same root as righteous. But in English, we don't say that you've been rightified. We say you've been justified, but it's the same root word. And it's a law court word. And some people say that justify means it's just as if I've never sinned. That's how they remember what it means. And, and that means that they're being declared not guilty. Like when a judge says, I, I find you not guilty of whatever charge the person has been facing. But it's even better than that here. It really means it's as if I've always obeyed. You see, that's what it's about. That's what the righteousness is. It's even better than being not guilty, which could mean that only you haven't done some things wrong. But justified means that you've done everything right. See, 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us this. For our sake he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When God looks at those who have put their faith in Christ, he sees Jesus and he sees his perfect obedience. He sees Jesus' righteousness and that righteousness becomes our righteousness. See, what Paul is saying is that, is that we're justified by Jesus' death in our place, by his sacrifice for us. Not by, doing by good, by, not by doing good things, not by keeping the law that we read from uh, Exodus chapter 20. See, that's not how you get saved. That's not how you get right with God. See, take a look at verse 16 there. Three times we're told that a person is not justified by works of the law. We're justified. We're not justified by doing good things. We're justified through faith in Jesus, Paul says. Because by observing the law, no one, not Jews, not Gentiles, not you, not me, not the Anzacs, no one is justified by works of the law, Paul says. No one is justified by doing good things. You see, the law just doesn't work like that. It doesn't justify you. In fact, all the law can do is to condemn you. So it's, it's like a speed camera. I don't know if you've ever had an interaction with a speed camera, but, but when you go past them, they don't pronounce you righteous. When you go, They don't say, good on you, you're under the speed limit. No, they only jump on you when you're over the speed limit. And that's, where, that's what the Old Testament law showed very clearly that Israel was doing wrong, like a speed camera tells us if we're doing wrong. And see, so the penalty is then spelled out uh, in the rest of the Old Testament. And, and the penalty, Paul is saying, has now been paid by Jesus, by his sacrificial death in our place. The penalty that is described in the law has been paid. And so in that way, when we have faith in Jesus, we are justified. It's not by trying harder. It's by standing with Jesus, standing behind him and being counted among the ones that he lived and died for. Let me illustrate how this works. This is a true story from one of my friends who, who knew this fellow called Barry. And Barry's brother-in-law was always getting into trouble. And he got into trouble and he was coming back one day to his car that was parked. There was a parking policeman who was writing a ticket out for him. 
And while he was there, he couldn't talk him out of it. He, you know, he was he's just back on time. It wasn't he couldn't talk him out of it. So he got so cross that he actually snorted the parking copper. He just clobbered him. And of course, the inevitable happened. He got arrested. He got fined, and his case went to court. Something about two thousand dollars, I believe, was the fine. And a couple of days later, before he's paid the fine, Barry's brother-in-law drops dead. He has a heart attack and pass, passes away. And so Barry, trying to do the right thing, goes down to help um, his sister do with the affairs that, that has happened with Barry's brother-in-law. And so one of the arrangements he had to make, he had to do, was to fix up the fine, what had gone on with that, because the fine hadn't been paid. So Barry's brother-in-law was dead, so he couldn't pay the fine. So, so Barry takes the paperwork down, he goes down into the courthouse, and he says to the clerk behind the desk, I've got my brother-in-law's penalty notice here, and I can tell you that he's not going to pay it. And uh, the clerk goes, well, OK, well, there are two options. He can pay up or he can go to jail. And so Barry's brother-in-law says, we'll take jail, thanks. Um, he's dead. Where do you want me to put him? Well, that changes everything. The clerk, oh, uh, hang on. Uh, so, of course, the clerk goes away and uh, because, you know, he can't do anything with him. And because if you're dead, there's nothing that the law can do to you. So when you're dead, there's no further penalties apply. When you're dead, you're free from the rule of the law. And so instead of putting the dead brother-in-law into jail, the legal clerk just took out the paperwork, took out his big stamp, stamped a cease on the paperwork, and that was that. End of, end of story. It was all done. Which is kind of the logic that Paul is saying here in Galatians chapter 2. That the hold of the Old Testament law, the rules, the requirements, the penalties that Israel had to live by, their hold over, him, over them has, is gone. Because... Paul says he's dead. We're dead. He's been crucified with Christ. So you take a look at verses 19 and 20 again, because that's what he's saying. You see, we're used to looking at, in some senses, the other way around. We're used to seeing and saying that Jesus died for my sins, which, of course, is true. But Paul here is spinning it around the other way because he says, when Jesus dies on the cross representing me, it's like in the eyes of the law, I'm hanging there with him and I'm counted as dead. I've been crucified with Christ through the law. I have died to the law. That's what verse 19 says. The law counts me dead so that I might live for God. And he says it again. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lived. I'm counted as dead, stamped deceased on all my papers. See, Judgment Day has already fallen on those who have faith in Jesus because at the cross, we were already crucified with Christ. So the worst thing that could ever happen to you has already happened. It's behind you. Since you were condemned at the cross, you've died to the law. It can't condemn you or me again. But it only can do that. It can only do that because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And then we're united with him forever. Our destinies are bound together with Jesus. See, think of a child in the womb. When the mother goes to Spain, the child goes to Spain. When the mother goes into space, the child goes into space. And it's in the same way that we're united with Christ. Your life is hid in him. You were crucified with Christ, and as surely as Christ died, so did you. And as surely as Christ rose, so did you. You're now alive to God, to live for God. It's the great exchange that 2 Corinthians 5, 21 spells out. Jesus takes our sin, dies in our place, sacrifices himself, becomes sin, the verse says, and in him... In him, the verse says, we get his righteousness. We are the righteousness of God. Our sin for his righteousness. Now that is a great exchange, isn't it? And Galatians 2.20 is one of the rare times in the Bible where Jesus' sacrifice is described in a very personal way. See, more often the Bible talks about Christ died for 
his people or his sheep or his church or his bride or the elect. But not here. It says that he died for me, for the Apostle Paul. See, here God's great plan that spans from eternity to eternity is radically individualised. Jesus, who is the creator of the universe, he gave himself for me. Yes, he, yes, he did die for everyone. But the fact of the matter is that God loved you and he loved you and he loved you personally so deeply that he died for you. And it's like if there was you were the only person in the world, he would still have died for you. Yes, he did die for the world, but he died for you, you personally. And even more incredibly, he did that while we were rebelling against him, while we were his enemies. He died for us, Romans tells us. So we don't think much about rebellion today. But sin is fundamentally rebellion. And we're all sinners, the Bible says. Sin is going our own way, doing our own thing, running our life our way, and that includes living as though God doesn't exist. That's what the Bible means by sin. So, so the, big th- the big sins like armed robbery and murder and those sort of things, well, well, of course they're sinful, but so are the wrong sort of everyday things that we do, the, the angry thoughts that we might not act on or, or, or the lies or the greed, the lack of kindness, the, the not treating others as we would want to be treated ourselves. The, these two are outworkings of our rebellion, of our running our own life, our own way. See, every one of us was in rebellion. And just like in the military, rebellion deserves serious, serious and severe punishment. But by the sheer grace and the love of God, we got the opposite. We got the opposite because God loves us. We got Jesus' sacrifice. We got his death for the world, but we got his death for you personally, for you alone. See, Jesus, the second person of the triune God, the one for whom and by whom all things were made, whether in heaven and on earth, whether visible or invisible, whether powers or authorities or or anything like that, everything that Jesus, who had all those things, he died for you. And he did that while you were a rebel, while you were going your own way. Now, that blows me away. That blows me away. Let that truth sink in. That's what Jesus did for you. See, no one can do enough good things to earn forgiveness, to be made right with God. See, you're not justified by doing the right thing. See, Paul's very, very clear on that. Three times he tells us in verses 15 and 16 exactly that. And then in verse 21, we're told that if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If you could get there by yourself, Christ died for no purpose. Being made right with God, being in Christ, having the great exchange completed, it's a free gift. And as with receiving any gift, we've got to take the gift. So if I said to you, Thomas, you can have my house. Thomas hasn't got the house, has he? Unless he comes over and takes it. You know, if Thomas says, look, I'm going to earn that. I can't possibly just take it for nothing. I'm going to, I'm going to look after it. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to do this. Or, 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 or I, do, I just don't think that Grant would really do that. It's just, no, it's just not, that's ridiculous. He wouldn't give me a house for no reason, just because, you know, of whatever. Well, it's, it's like that with the free gift from God, except it's, it's even greater than that. It's, it's, like, it's like, you know, I own Buckingham Palace. You know, which you could never, ever get anywhere near paying off. You know, you could get this much, really hardly anything. And Jesus says, you can have eternal life with him as a free gift, if you'll take that gift. And the question is, well, how do you take that extraordinary gift? How do you get made right with God? Well, you need to ask him. 
and put him in charge of your life. You need to say sorry for rebelling against him. Say sorry for the things that you've done wrong and ask him to come in into your life and to be your ruler, to be your king and to follow him. And you can have this extraordinary gift and do that. You see, that's what you've got to do to be made right with God, to be justified, to, to be righteous in him. You've got to accept that extraordinary gift. You, you can't be like Switzerland. You can't be a neutral country. You're either justified or you're not. There isn't an in-between state. There isn't a, uh, oh, well, I'll get to that later. You're either rebelling or you're not. And so as we start to think about that, I wanted to urge people, if they haven't thought about these things, to take that extraordinary gift to do that today, if you haven't done that, that sort of thing, to stop running your own life your own way, to submit to Jesus and to follow him, to put him in charge of your life. Sure, you'll, you'll never be perfect, but when you do fail, come back to God, say sorry, turn back to him, ask him to help you. You see, when you come back under Jesus' rule, it's, it's not a demanding and a harsh rule. It's not a strict, disciplinary type of rule. No, no it's, a, it's a loving and a compassionate, merciful type. See, so, so when you know Jesus and you're known by him, when you're in this personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, with the one who said to come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, rest for your souls. See, when you have a relationship with a ruler like that, you'll want to serve him you want to get to know him better because you'll know that getting to know him in a deeper way means that that you're deepening in your relationship with this wonderful person you want to live for him you, you want to be under his rule not be, because you trust him because he's the wisest and most loving person in the universe so why wouldn't you want to be in a deeper relationship with him well of course you will so take that step if you haven't done that already. But, but most of you here tonight, you've already done that. And the application, I think, for you is to remember afresh what Jesus has done for you. Remember afresh that, that you are justified, that you are right with God, and then live that out. So as verse 20 says, you know, that the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself. For me. So although God is against, um, against earning, he still requires effort. See, Christians are to live out our union with Christ. So, so ask the Holy Spirit to bring to mind some of the areas of your life that you're not living out that reality of being united with him. Confess your need for help. Ask for change. Ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to be more loving more joyful, more peaceful, more patient, more kind, to do more good, be more gentle, more faithful, more self-controlled, to be less harsh or angry or self-righteous or unforgiving. Whatever area the Holy Spirit brings to mind, take that to him and ask for help. And when you fail, because we all fail at different points, ask for forgiveness Turn to God. Remind yourself of the gospel. You have been justified by faith. You are righteous with God. You don't deserve it. You haven't done enough good things to earn that. Jesus has paid the penalty for your sin. And you can trust him. He's been crucified. So have you with him. Oh, Father, thank you for that. Thank you that I am right with you. Help me to live more and more like Jesus. Because that's what you want to do. Out of gratitude for what Jesus has done for you. See, the story of Anzac touches a deep part in all of us. A little over 100 years ago, thousands of people gave their lives so that we might live the life that we do now in Australia. But a little over 2,000 years ago, one perfect man, God the Son, gave his life 
that all humanity, yes, yeah, sure, but also you, that you could live for him, that you could be in that right relationship with him. We remember their sacrifice. We remember his sacrifice. I remember, lest we forget. Grant Dibden, uh, and uh, I'm involved with the Defence Force, as you can probably see from some of the stuff that I'm wearing. Been involved with them for 44 years and uh, been a chaplain uh, in the reserve for about 15 years and then just recently became the Anglican Defence Force Bishop. Fantastic. Um, do you want to tell people, like, you've got two sets of medals, how does that work? Yeah, it's not that I'm twice as good. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the ones on the left-hand side are the ones over your heart and they're my medals for uh, the service that I've uh, done uh, throughout my career of those 44 years. And then anything on the right-hand side is somebody that you're related to in, the, in that sense. And so these are my father's medals. Uh, my father uh, was in the British Navy, um, started World War II from the very first day, went all the way through the war. Um, sunk twice, cast adrift in the Atlantic, at, at Dunkirk, at Dieppe. Um, but also I'm not wearing my mother's medal. She was in the Australian Air Force uh, in World War II and my grandfather's medals who was in World War I in the trenches uh, or my uncle who was killed on the Kokoda track. Um, so uh, so a little, it's great to be able to share on Anzac Day, um, you know, coming from that sort of family. Yeah. Um, so Grant, you've been uh, sharing at all our services today so far, both morning services and tonight, um, and um, uh, you're going to be yeah, talking a bit about the context of service in, in the Anzac Day thing. You, one of your roles is to oversight chaplains. Um, do you want to just tell us how many chaplains and where they are situated, uh, or kind of full-time reserve, etc.? Yeah. Sure. So. Um the Defence Force has a, has a lot of chaplains, really, uh, and, and I look after the Anglicans, supporting them, caring for them, serving them. Uh, we have about uh, 90. It varies depending on which day of the week is because you've got people coming in and going out and some in training and that, that sort of thing. But there's about 90 right now and there's about 45 full-time and about 45 reservists, uh, which means that they're part-time and they're, they're all around Australia in the Army, Navy and Air Force. So pretty well anywhere you go there's a chaplain or pretty close to a chaplain somewhere either full-time or part-time uh, and I travel around uh, supporting them catching up with them seeing how they're going um, and I've been doing that uh, a fair bit since COVID has allowed me to do that. Mm.